Let's go ahead and, and uh, pray so that we can get into our notes this evening. Let's look to, let's pray. Lord God, once again, as we come together, we give you thanks and praise as we look this evening specifically at your great kindness and mercy in giving to the church apostles. Also, God, in so giving us your word that we will not be deceived by those who will claim that status today. We thank you for the trustworthiness and the clarity of your word. I pray that you would cause all that we consider this evening to continue to strengthen, fortify, stabilize us against the winds of this world and uh, that we would not be moved. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, today we are going to be looking at an apostle of Jesus Christ. Um, it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, And he, that is Christ, gave the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Now we're going to look at some of those other things later on, but today we're looking specifically at apostles and the unique role that apostles had. Remember, I'm giving you the notes, and they are somewhat thorough for you to read through, but we're going to motor through them more quickly, kind of highlighting the texts with the, the verbal discussions. Now, one thing to note this, even in the days of the early apostles, in the days just after Jesus had risen from the dead and ascended, it did not take long for there to be false apostles okay second corinthians chapter 11 verse 13 speaks of certain men who are already at work in the early days of the church such men are it says false apostles deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of christ so they come in with all the right words and all the right, right language and all the right claims. We are apostles of Christ, but they are false. Now there has to be a way then to recognize, well, who is a true apostle and who is a false apostle? How can we tell the difference or how could they tell the difference? For us, it's pretty easy. Here's how you can tell if somebody's a false apostle today. They claim to be an apostle. <laughs> okay, that makes it really easy. Uh, but but we'll consider why that claim is also wrong and false as as we move our way through. I want you to note this: uh, the term apostolos, which is the Greek term, there appears about eighty times in seventy nine verses in the Greek New Testament. Of these 80 times, 68 of them are written by Paul and Luke. Only three occurrences, um, and I've noted those three occurrences, seem to refer to something other than the 12 and a few special editions. And we'll look at those, the special editions. Matthias wasn't one of the original 12. Judas was, he died, another man would take his office. It was Matthias. Then we would also have James, the brother of the Lord. We would have Paul and Barnabas and Lucy. Um, one reference referring to an apostle is referring to Christ himself. And we're going to see the reason why it refers to Christ himself and the reason why in three places it refers to some others is because the word apostle most simply means messenger. Okay. And so it's, and here's an example in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker for your benefit. As for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. The ESV note in your Bible footnote would say, messengers is the Greek word apostolos. But I want you to note something different regarding these men. They are messengers of the churches as opposed to messengers of Jesus Christ. Okay, 
So the ones who are, are entrusting them and appointing them are churches. For the apostles, what we would, in our minds, capital A apostles, they are the ones who are appointed by Christ himself. They represent not a specific church as a messenger. See, again, a messenger for the churches would be, let us send a messenger, and you're the messenger. Go and meet Paul. This is what you need to tell him. And the message would be given to the messenger from the church, most likely even from the church leaders. Then the messenger would go, and he would get to that place, and he would say, I have a message for you from the church. Here's the message. And he would deliver the message. He didn't invent the message. He didn't concoct it. Hopefully he remembered it. But he, he, he was sent by someone to convey their message in their name. The apostles of Jesus Christ were sent by Christ to convey his message in his name. So it's really not that hard to understand. The other translations for this section here uh, in 2 Corinthians 8.23, the NIV says representatives rather than messengers. The King James, the New Revised Standard, the New American Standard all say messengers. But it's interesting to note this. It says messengers even though the Greek word is apostolos. So for, they've chosen for our protection to when it's referring to the apostles to translate the word apostolos as apostles. When it's not referring to those men, let's go ahead and change it from apostles to messengers or representatives. Uh, that can be helpful, but they do the same thing. And later on, we're going to be able to see this. The same word for uh, revelation and apocalypsos. The same word is given in a number of different contexts in a number of different circumstances. And the church preachers and teachers have decided some of those apocalypsos, those revelations, are God divinely revealing his word to his apostles. Some of them is the Spirit illuminating us to understand those things. And so we often will use the word revelation for what was given to the apostles, illumination as for what happens to us. But even though we're using different words, it's the same word in the Greek. But that's, it's not necessarily wrong to use different words because even as there was an apostle, and that was a distinct kind of an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, a different kind of apostle, a messenger of the churches, same word, but different roles. Even with revelation, there are distinctive revelations, and so the language of, of men changed it a little bit so that we don't get misled. Also, for those who love the Greek, what you have there in terms of, of the Lord Jesus Christ or of the churches, uh, the phrase there, it will have the word apostolos and then the what's called the genitive will be the churches. The genitive will be Jesus Christ. The, the word of does not exist in the Greek language. The word of is inserted for our English understanding when it is the genitive, which means of or belonging to. All right, so an apostle of or belonging to Jesus Christ, an apostle of or belonging to the churches. All right, page 29 goes to page 30. I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my fellow, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger to my need. So again, you see these uh, number of places where certain individuals have the term apostle, but they are not apostles. Now let's go on down to where it says, so often. Now, so often when we hear the word disciple, 
we tend to think of the 12 apostles. And that's probably because Matthew uses disciple to refer to them all the time, the 12 disciples, the 12 disciples. Matthew often does that in his gospel. But when by him doing that, what we do somewhat miss is the word disciple is very often used in the book of Acts, isn't it? Yes, it is. And in the book of Acts, who is it referring to when it says disciples? What we would call the believers or the Christians, okay? They would later be called in a accusatory manner, Christians first in Antioch, but they were always considered disciples. So it's important to note there were not just 12 men following Jesus around. There were far more. There were not just men following Jesus around. There were also women following Jesus around. Okay? So it's important to be aware of that when Jesus chose who among his disciples would be the apostles. It wasn't that he didn't have any women in the, in the pool of candidates. There were women there. There were women who traveled with him. There were women who met their needs out of their own finances. But the scriptures indicate to us uh, Jesus from this larger group made a selection. Go with me to Luke chapter 6, verse 12. In these days, he, that's Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God the Father. Verse 13, when day came, he called his disciples and he chose from them 12. So let's just see that. He called his disciples. How many was it? Well, he's going to call 12 out of the disciples. But we know, for example, in the early days after his resurrection, there were 120 disciples in Jerusalem. We know that there were big groups that were traveling with him. So, uh, but it was a trick question when I say how many disciples were with him. The actual answer is we don't know. We know it was a good many because later in the Gospel of John, when he delivers a, a message that's hard for them to accept, many of them are going to turn back and follow him no more. So it says this, he came, he called his disciples and chose from them, chose from the larger group of disciples, 12 whom he named apostles. They were uniquely chosen from among all of the disciples to be his representative messengers. They alone would be authorized to speak for him, to speak on his behalf. Okay, as his messenger. Now, we would have concluded at this point that these men and only these men would ever be apostles, but the word of God adds more than these, also by Christ's appointment, and uh, Christ must appoint them and they must meet the criteria. With regard to these 12, for 11 of them, they're spoken to in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and this is what it says. Jesus says to these men, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. These men would specifically be granted an empowering of the Spirit. They would be his spokesmen, his messengers, his witnesses. Again, the term here for witness is that is a phrase, it's, it's a word that from which we derive the term martyr, which sounds like you're going to die. But you didn't have to die to be a martyr in, in, in Greek. It meant you were a first-hand witness. It meant you were an eyewitness. You're not telling what somebody told you about. You're telling what you yourself saw, heard, and experienced. Okay? That's a, a martyr. 
or uh, a witness at this point. Okay, um, we also know, and from the book of Acts, they are going to replace Judas. And this is very helpful because from this, we are able to derive or extrapolate three crucial requirements in order to be apostles. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 22, the scriptures simply say this, as they're looking for someone, Really, I'll say beginning of verse 21, actually. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all of the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us from the beginning of the baptism of John until the day he was taken up for us. So the first thing we were noting is we want somebody who was with Jesus the whole time of his earthly ministry so that they heard all of his teaching. They got the fullness of the teaching directly from Jesus. Now, please note, what the apostles have not yet understood is that God is not bound by that. Christ and the Spirit are not bound by that. He's going to be able to take someone like Paul, who was not with them for any of those days of roaming around, and Christ himself be able to deliver the fullness of his faithful message to Paul that can be then delivered to others. So practically speaking, it didn't really have to be someone who had heard it all with their own ears during his earthly ministry because Jesus could and would continue to meet with and instruct the apostles throughout their ministry. Even as we see John in the book of Revelation being caught up in a vision of Christ. But let's go on down here. He would have to, uh, uh, basically, that, that sense of uh, all that time that their commitment was, he must have received his teaching directly from Christ. They were thinking that might be the only way to receive it directly from Christ, but that's a, that's a necessary requirement. And that he would become with us, into verse 23, okay, uh, become with us a witness to his resurrection. Now by witness, what did I already tell you before? The term witness is first-hand eyewitness. He will be able to say, I have seen the risen Savior. And then they put two forward. And at, at the end of there in verse 23, it says they put two forward, Joseph called Barsabbas, uh, who was also called Justice. Three different names. No wonder they didn't choose him. Oh. No. <laughs> and Matthias, way easier. Here's one. No, that's not why he wasn't chosen. They didn't choose any of them, did they? I love this because it says in verse 24 of Acts 1, they prayed and said, you, Lord, know the hearts of of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the ministry of apostleship from Judas that he turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the other 11. When he's numbered with the other 11, what now would be the total number? 11 plus 1 rounds off to approximately... Yeah, it, it kind of nails 12 exactly, doesn't it? And so now you have 12 apostles again. And so from that, some would say, well, Paul is not qualified because Paul did not travel with Jesus from the, when he began his earthly ministry until he was taken up. Paul wasn't there during those things to see it. Therefore, Paul can't be an apostle, someone might say. 1 Corinthians 9.1 says this. Paul says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord. 
All right, ultimately, this gives us three critical qualifications to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. One, he must have actually seen Jesus resurrected, alive again. Two, he must get his teaching or instruction message directly from Jesus because he is Jesus's messenger. And if you didn't get your message directly from Jesus, you can't be his messenger, right? Third, he must be appointed, specifically designated by Christ, by God, to be an apostle. So pretty simple. Now, some add he must have the ability to work miracles. But the problem with that is uh, he doesn't have to have had that ability to be qualified to be an apostle. He would be, in exercising his apostleship, he would be granted that ability. You get what I'm saying? So uh, before being established as an apostle, he would have had to have seen the risen Lord. He would have ha had to have received teaching directly from Jesus, which would kind of require seeing him as well. And he would have to be appointed by the Lord. Now, as he goes forward in apostleship, surely he will also be endowed with requisite giftings of miracles and such that would attest to the word that he shared. Okay, so these are the three requirements. Go on with me to page 31. And we're going to see how Paul met these requirements also. Galatians 1, 11 to 17. I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not a man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if I were to ask you this question, where did Paul receive his message from? Yeah, we get that straight from the scriptures. Now, someone's going to come roaming in from crazy land and say, well, this is his own claim. I mean, he wants to be seen as an apostle. This is his own claim. We don't take him at his word. And, and it's like, well, you're, we're going to see even more that unpacks and unfolds these things. Further, we also know that he and Barnabas were also extended the right hand of fellowship by those who were apostles before them in Jerusalem. But let's keep going. Um, nor did I consult with anyone. Verse 17 of Galatians 1 says, Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. So as soon as he was uh, received the revelation of Christ and was an appointed an apostle, he didn't run over to Jerusalem so that the apostles could authenticate him. Because, listen, apostles do not make apostles. Jesus makes apostles. So if you, you know, if you, again, if you're in this a world today that believes in some sort of creative, nonsensical tradition of apostolic succession, all right, well, this guy just, uh, just died. We got to figure out who we're going to put in his place because we got to keep filling Peter's office, you know, uh, that's not going to happen. You can't sit together and vote. You can't plan that out. Only Jesus could appoint apostles. Simple as that. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God, our Savior, and of Jesus Christ. So who appointed him? All right, so now we're getting the, the qualification. Where did he receive his message from? Jesus. Who appointed him? Jesus and God. Which actually, even when Jesus chose the 12, he had just spent what? All night in prayer. And so it was a gloriously mutual decision of the Godhead. Paul further, uh, in Acts chapter 22, says, or we're told this concerning Paul. This is, uh, as he's giving his testimony. This is what a man named Ananias, who has come to meet him while he is blinded, explains to him 
as he meets him. He says this, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will. Wouldn't that be nice if he appointed you to know his will as well? I mean, it, how beautiful is that when it comes down to figuring out what is the will of God, what is pleasing to God, what God would have us do as Christians. Paul was appointed by God to know his will. So when Paul sets forth, this is the will of God for you. This is the instruction for you. This is what God would have you do. This is what's pleasing to God. This is what God says turn away from. He was uniquely endowed by God as an apostle, together with the other apostles, to what? Know the will of God. Now you may say, oh no, I wish I had that. Well, he had it. And you have him. The apostles had it, and we have what the apostles came to know. So if you want to know what is the will of God, it's there. Make good use of it. Secondly, not only appointed, but what? To see the righteous one. Who is the righteous one? That is the Christ, the holy and righteous one, the perfect one, the blemish less spotless lamb of God, the one who fulfilled all righteousness on behalf of his people. He would see him, like literally see him. Now, I know when I say that, you're probably aware of someone somewhere who claims they've seen him. I'm going to demonstrate to you tonight while, why that is flawed and faulty, while they are, why they are deceived or they are just deceiving others. I'll see that this evening. Okay. Um, and to hear a voice from his mouth. I witness to the resurrected Lord, receiving his teaching directly from Christ, being granted extraordinarily by God to know his will. Verse 15, for you will be a witness. This is a first-hand I witness to everyone of what you have, key phrase, seen and heard. Okay. That phrase, seen and heard, is going to become very important on the following pages. Okay, but pick that up. Paul also is granted what he has seen and heard. Now go on down with me to Acts chapter 10. We are told this in the book of Acts. Jesus, who had died, God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. So when Jesus was raised, did he just appear to everybody? Made him to appear, verse 41. Not to all the people. So only some? So God chose to only let Jesus be seen by some? Well, that doesn't seem fair. People always say that when God makes choices, don't they? It's amazing that God would grant any to see him. Why are we stunned by, you know, it's amazingly merciful. We don't ever want fair or just from God because that means we're cast out. We remain in blindness and deadness and deafness. Okay, um, not to all people, but to us who had been chosen as his witnesses. Even further to corroborate the original apostles who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Okay, we're not talking about randos who just show up. We're talking about actually guys who knew him, saw him. So it's not like, well, so you think that was Jesus? Well, I never met him, but... Uh, I mean, he, he, he spoke pretty cool. It, it, it's not this. These men spent years with him. They knew him. They knew his voice. They knew his teaching. They knew, his, they knew him. They, of course, even saw the marks in his hand, the wound in his side. It, he, and he commanded us to preach 
to the people and testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. We're also going to go down to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is when we begin to get the limits of apostleship. Okay? So we had originally 12. One didn't quite make it. Matthias was put into his place. We know after a short period of time, James, the brother of the... Uh, or. James, the brother of John, would be beheaded. And it does seem, and I'll just put this out there, it does seem that for a period of time, while there were still potentially qualified men, they would go ahead and fill the office. While there were qualified men, but that would be very limited and for a season. Let's see it right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 4 to 8. Speaking of Christ, those things of first importance, he was buried, he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. And when he was raised, he appeared to Cephas. What is Cephas's other well-known name? Peter, right? Now, then to the 12. Now, somebody might want to get really particular here and say, not to the 12, to the 11 because Judas was already not with them and Matthias was not with them and, and they're going to want to be make, they were it's a phrase that refers to the appointed apostles the 12 even when they were they were down to 11 they could still be referred to as the 12 because soon they would be topped up to 12 <laughs> right okay now then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. All right, so here's a little something for you. There is a gathering of 500 believers, and Christ appeared to all of them. Now, this is beautiful because it does a couple things. One, it keeps somebody from coming in and saying... Well, these apostles, these 12 men have a vested interest. I mean, they've already given three plus years of their life to follow this guy around. It's all a wash if they don't claim he rose from the dead. Uh, you can't trust them. They're, they're biased. And, and weirdly, people try to say that even now. They do. But so that could not be a claim made against them. Jesus went ahead and appeared to 500 at one time so that it wasn't just 12 men in a secret corner room that saw him. It was widely corroborated. Now, and it says, most of whom, by the time writing of 1 Corinthians, are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Fallen asleep is used euphemistically, as the opposite of still alive, please figure it out. All right. Sounds wonderful. Uh, then he appeared to James. Now that's interesting to note because James, the brother of our Lord, is functioning in an apostolic role by, by Acts 15, isn't he? And so it's like, well, uh, why to James? James wasn't one of those who was with him from like Matthias from the days. No, but James was one who was granted to see him. And those who were uniquely granted to see him were granted because to some extent, it was the design of God that they would be appointed as witnesses. Not to all, but to those who were to be appointed witnesses. Then look with me and... Then do all the apostles. Now, verse 8. Last of all. All right. Let's do the math on that. So after this, how many more are remaining? So if this is the last of all, this is the final, right? So if you're making a list of those who would see the risen Lord. What do you got? 
All right, see this? Now, this is not a complete and thorough list. Somebody wants to run in and say, well, it, it doesn't say Mary, and we know Mary saw Jesus. Well, no, it's not intended to be a thorough list. It's because, do you have a list of the 500? I don't have a list of the 500. But what this is intended to do is to start in the earliest day of his resurrection, when he appeared to Peter, and then the last. It's to kind of bookend the event and bring it to completion. And why Cephas instead of Mary? Because Mary was not appointed an apostle, right? The emphasis here is, is on those who are having apostolic qualification. He appeared last of all as one untimely born. He appeared also to me. So you have Peter, you have the 12, you have 500 names, you have James's name, and the last name at the bottom of the list is Paul. Now, for everyone on that list, John is on that list, right? Because John is one of the 12. So is he going to appear again to John? Yeah. Peter's on that list. Is he going to appear and speak again to Peter? Yes. We have accounts of that, right? God's speaking to him on Simon the Tanner's house. We have John on the Isle of Patmos and Christ appearing to him and engaging him. But what you have here now is a final list. And if your name on, isn't on that list, you don't get to see Jesus. Now, how can you say that with such confidence? He appeared last of all to me. Page 32. The idea, last of all, right there in the middle of page 32, eschaton de panto. Eschaton, we know eschatology, right? Study of last time, end times, last things. That simply means last of all. Simple translation. The meaning of eschatos, given by Strong's, is this. Extreme, last in time or in place, or the last in a series of places. Last in temporal succession. One thing that keeps coming up in that phrase is what? In the definition, last. <laughs> uh, Loenidas' semantic domain says it's pertaining to being last in a series of objects or events. Last, final, finally. I mean, that, that's, that's like putting a period at the end of the line, you know, and just press it until it goes right through the paper, you know, and then tears the rest of the page off that you can't write anymore. It's done. Last of all, to him. So that's why we'll say this. Um, is it possible that there are, to, to be an apostle, you have to have seen the risen Lord, right? Be appointed by him, get your teaching direct from him. He appeared last of all to Paul. So the only possibility that someone would be an apostle today is if they were among those 500 that he appeared to at one time, which would mean they have to be about 2,000 years old. And some of us look approximately that, but nonetheless, no one is, right? So there cannot be apostles today. So if somebody starts a YouTube channel and calls themselves apostle something, something, is it right? No, not at all. And, and it's pretty popular today. There's this lady roaming around, calling herself an apostle and getting all kinds of followers. Apostle Catherine Crick, something like that. She's missing out on all kinds of things because of what God's called her to do. No, no, no. She's missing out on all kinds of things because she doesn't understand what God has called every one of his people to do. 
She's lost her way. Now, let's pick this up further down. Understanding now, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. We're talking now about Jesus Christ speaking. We're going to return to Jesus Christ appearing, but we know it's last of all to Paul. What about speaking? Well, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets many times in many various ways, right? Various and sundry ways. But in these last days, he has spoken. Does that sound does that sound like he is speaking or he has spoken? If someone has spoken, they're done. Right? And he spoke to us what? By his son. Well, wait a second. If he spoke to us by his so in the past it was through the prophets, in the last days it was through his son, then how, how did we get any, any of this? Well, who did his son speak through? His appointed messengers, representatives. He spoke, Jesus spoke to, indeed, through them. That's why Paul says, anyone who thinks he's a prophet or spiritual has to acknowledge that what I write to you is a command of the Lord. Okay? So you can see the scriptures very clearly teach this. In the past... And I give a hint of what in the past means. Not anymore. <laughs> but in these last days, another hint. It's different than it was before. Right? He has spoken to us. That is in the aorist. Aorist is like a past tense for us in English. He has spoken. It does not say he will speak. It does not say he does speak. It does not say he can speak. It does say what? He has spoken. Now, listen, you will find the odd person creeping out of the woodwork and trying to say this, but couldn't Jesus speak today if he wanted to? Like, oh, how dare you challenge what Jesus could do Obviously, he could, but what you're, what you're misunderstanding is he could not want to because that would be to act contrary to his own word as having finished speaking. So, yeah, if he wanted to, but he can't want to, he don't want to, he ain't going to want to. Amen. Did I say that in everyone's language? <laughs> Okay, so page thirty-three. So this is a completed action. His son spoke to us through the apostles, and his message can, should, and must be repeated by men. And the words, when we read or are spoken, still resound the voice of Christ. When we read the scriptures, it is the living word of God, okay? So I can say this. There is a sense that what he has spoken still speaks. Yes? So there's a sense in which Christ still speaks, but he does not speak anything more or anything further or any way outside of having spoken to us through his apostles. Okay, let's get, let's get a little clearer here. So what about when people today say they got new messages, they heard audible voices, or still small voices, or dreams or visions? Okay, now at this point I want to make it clear. I'm not saying they did not hear audible voices. I'm not saying that they did not have a dream or a vision. I'm not saying that they did not hear a still small voice. I'm saying it was not God. It was not Jesus. Okay? They may have heard something. They may have seen something, but it was not God and it was not Jesus. Therefore, we should be very, very cautious. Now, 
Why do I say that so strongly? Let's listen to Jesus's warning. Very, very important. Uh, Jesus warns that people will be confused and deceived by false appearings. People are going to not only be false disciples, uh, false apostles, they're going to be false messiahs, false Christs. Matthew 24, 24, Jesus says, false Christs and false prophets will arise. So somebody rises up and says, I am a prophet of God. And then they prove it by doing a miracle. Did you believe them? Well, let's finish reading what Jesus says. False prophets will arise performing great signs and wonders. So here's the temptation. Well, I didn't want to believe them, but they did a great sign and wonder. It's an indisputable miracle. So they must be a true prophet. People talk like that, don't they? And it's not irrational. It's just unbiblical. I mean, I understand the logic of it. Well, I mean, could they do that miracle if they were not of God? Here's your answer. Yes, they could. Well, why would God allow that? Glad you asked, but our time is short. So we will look at that later under the issue of prophets, where God would allow false prophets to prophesy and then that prophecy would come true. And people would say, oh, this is a true prophet. And then God would see when they start to give false teaching that is at odds with the law, will they follow that man because that man's had a prophecy come true? Or will they trust the unmoving word of God? God allowed it to test them. We're going to see that in the book of Deuteronomy. Okay. To lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So even the true children of God can at some point be like, man, I wonder. I mean, this is pretty impressive. You know, is it possible? Maybe this guy, and, and that might roll around in the head of some of the elect for a moment. God willing, he'll bring someone along with a fuller teaching who can protect them. And that just because that fella can jump 10 feet on a trampoline doesn't mean he's a prophet of God. Some of you may know what I'm talking about. There's a false teacher in Oklahoma City who's recently done that. Trampoline Sunday, my friend. We ain't having it here, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it happened. I think he even did a flip one time and everybody's like, wow, that's not impressive. You can... Yeah, kids do that. Okay, um, Jesus says that the, uh, those who appear are false Christ, um, even though they do signs and wonders. Listen, Jesus even further explaining the danger. See, I've told you beforehand, if, if someone says to you, look, he's in the wilderness. And I've even heard people this. If you go out in the wilderness, get away from everybody and maybe take a vow of silence and maybe fast for 21 days, 40 days. Most people say three days, and I get it. <laughs> but, uh, not even three, okay. Can, can I have two? Oh, okay. Uh, but the, the idea, yeah, if, I went out in the wilderness, and I did this, and you know what? Jesus appeared to me. Yeah, and he told me all Christians wear blue and only blue. Hey, it worked out. I didn't even look down. <laughs> I'm okay. No, no. If somebody says that, they're lying. Because what does Jesus say? Do not go out. Don't, don't try to follow them out there. Don't try to replicate their little story of, of how they pulled off this mystical meeting. It's nonsense. If they say, look, he's in the inner room. Here I was in the secret quiet place all by myself. 
and suddenly appear. What does Jesus say? Do not believe it. Right? Mark says it this way. If someone says, look, here's the Christ. Look, there he is. Do not believe it. Anybody says they saw him. Do not believe it. <clears throat> Why? False Christ, false prophets will appear, great signs and wonders. Be on your guard. I've told you this beforehand. Now, still in Matthew 24, where Jesus is saying, wilderness, don't believe it. Inner room, don't believe it. Here's why you don't believe it. By verse 27, he explains, when he comes, it's not out in the wilderness. It's not in the corner of your closet. As lightning comes from east and flashes as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, ain't going to be one fella saying, I saw. It's going to be a lot of people seeing. When he comes, it ain't going to be questionable. It ain't going to be uncertain. And it isn't even going to be earthly. There's going to be signs in the heaven. And there is going to be a peering of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Mark, it says this, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened. That'll give you a hint. The moon will not give its light. So that means the only, the, the stars fall from the heavens. That means when you look up, it would be relatively dark, yeah? Because every previous source of light in the sky is no longer there. And into this utter darkness, coming in it will be the Son of Man shining with the glory of God. Yeah. There's no need for any of those other secondary lights anymore. And, the, and then they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with great power and glory. So that You're not going to need somebody to tell you, hey, I saw. Anyone who says I saw, you can tell them I'm sorry you didn't. Because Paul was the last, and the next time ain't going to be just you, my friend. We're all going to see it. It's going to be really, really obvious. And I'll give you guys a hint if you happen to be here at the time. If the sun falls from the sky <laughs> and the stars, and all of a sudden there's no light up there, look up, my friends. <laughs> look up. Our redemption draws near, near, near. Oh, glorious. All right, so. So there we, we have that now on to page 34. We, we hear the written word inspired by the Spirit. Okay, that's what we hear. Now let's see the difference between the apostles. The apostles declare what they have seen and heard from Christ. Acts 4.20, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Acts 24, 15, for you will be a witness to everyone of what you have seen and heard. First John, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, but we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life was made manifest, and we have seen it. It's like, calm down, John. You seem to be going a little over the top with the you have seen, you have heard thing. It's not over the top. It's distinctive of an apostle, and it's to mark them out. And it's to mark off anyone else who would make that claim. We have seen it. Verse 3 says also what? That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. Why? Because they get their message directly from him. They are the messengers of Jesus Christ. They declare it. Uh, not so that we will also see or hear, literally, but that we may have fellowship with them, the Father and the Son. What do we see? Well, listen to what the scripture says about those who are not apostles. What should be our expectation? In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it tells us what faith is. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, 
the conviction of things not seen. So when somebody says, I know he rose from the dead because I've seen him. Right? That's not faith, my friend. Faith is the conviction of things not seen. So uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith and not by sight, right? The apostles see and hear we what we are expected not to see, but to hear the message and believe. In John chapter 20, Jesus said this to him after his resurrection. Have you believed in me because you've seen me? This is not complimentary, right? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So here's what I here's some advice I can give to you. If you ever come across somebody who says they've seen, you tell them, "Oh, I'm so sorry. I feel so sorry. For, my heart is broken for you, because blessed are those who have not seen. No, and and you're just not as blessed as those of us <laughs> who have not seen. Uh, I, my heart breaks for you, poor fellow. Yeah." <laughs> Because Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, right? That's what he said. But the person who's saying they've seen, what are they usually claiming? I'm more blessed than you. <laughs> I'm more blessed than everybody. I, no, no, no. You are not more blessed. You're less blessed because you think you've seen and you haven't. So one, you're deceived rather than blessed. And I'm questioning because you're saying that you believe, is your faith rooted in your sight? Uh-oh. <laughs> That's not how it's supposed to be. And again, so that we understand that Peter can write to the saints spread abroad through the, the dispersion, just all over the place, right? And what does he say to all of them? Though you have not seen him. Wait a second, Peter. Did you go to all those places and interview every single one of them? How can you say with confidence, none of those people have ever seen him? Because uh, I'm writing to these people who are not from Jerusalem. They weren't among the 500 who saw him. And, and they weren't, yeah, if they weren't on that list, I know everyone who was on that list. Did Peter not know who was on that list? Who was the last one added? Paul. So he knows. You've not seen him. You love him. Though you do not now see him. So he's wanting them to know. Not only have you not seen him, you're not going to see him. Seeing him is not part of what you're about. It's just not. Well, someday we will all see him. But until then, no. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and what? Rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Now, I will tell you this. I've met people who have told me, I know that I saw Jesus because after I had that vision experience, I was overcome with inexpressible joy filled with glory. Like, hold on a second. That's not what comes from seeing. That what, that's what comes from not seeing, <laughs> loving, and believing. So does this sound like we're missing out on something because we don't see? No. The faith that is granted to us is as firm as sight. And it is even superior because it is an entire work of grace that rests entirely by faith on the person of Christ, and it fills us with assurance and inexpressible joy. All right, John 17, Jesus prays, not only for the apostles, but even for us, and he makes a pretty clear distinction. I do not ask for these only, but also for what? Those who will believe in me through their word. 
But wait a second, are you saying that faith comes by hearing? Uh, yeah! Hearing like the Word of God? Yeah! That's exact, you mean the exact gospel given to us by the apostles and faith comes by that? Yes! Does it come any other way? No! There's no appearances, there's no thing. The design was they got to see, they got to hear, and then they share. What they share has been written down and passed through the generations, and faith comes by hearing, right? We're all acquainted with Romans 10, I would hope, as it says it right there. How will they hear unless someone is sent? How will they believe unless they hear? How will they call? We see that the whole pattern now, post-apostles, is all based on the proclamation of, the hearing, and then the gracious work of God that imparts faith that is as strong as sight, right? And it's not lacking any of the joyful attendants that come with it. Page 35, closing page. Here's a warning, or, or I mean, uh, still the, the solidifying of what I've been saying. Um, thanks be to God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it for uh, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God. What does Paul say? The word that came through apostles is not the word of men, it's the word of God. And it is that word that was given through the apostles that alone is the word of God and is the word that is at work in the believers which is at work in you believers. Ephesians 1, 13. In him, in Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the Holy Spirit. We're the, the ongoing expectation of our salvific experience and our walk in grace is all going to be led by hearing, Right? We hear the gospel and it brings us to salvation. We continue to hear and read the word. And remember, it's, it's interesting to note, we live in a different age and era, but the ancient way of reading was always reading aloud. So every time they read, they heard. You know, we read in our heads, we pray in our heads, we do all kinds of stuff silently in our heads. That's not what they did. And it is in the hearing of the word of God that there is great renewing of our minds. Whoever believes in the Son has the testimony in himself, and that is on the basis of the testimony of God that has been born. Now we, verse 13 of Titus 2, are waiting for the blessed hope and appearing of God. We're not expecting it, tonight, tomorrow, in the wilderness, in the inner room, or in our dreams. We are waiting for the glorious appearing. That's how it happens. It was, and it will be glorious. Uh, on down to the closing verses, heed the warnings of Christ. Such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. So Satan might appear to people pretending to be what? An angel. An angel sent by Christ. You know, he might meet some little fella in a cave somewhere. And that fella, you know, comes up with the Quran that some angel gave to him. But if that word is different and is adding to the full and final word, he spoke last of all through who? Christ. And then Paul was the last added to the list of potential apostles. So when some guy later says, an angel of light appeared to me and gave me new revelation. What you need to tell him is, that was Satan. <laughs> you know, it's not God. It's not, there's no... He, the last one that he has spoken through is his son. There is no later one who speaks with that direct authority. All right? 
uh, or if somebody claims to get some tablets from an angel Moroni on a mountain somewhere, you know, and they establish their own religion in Utah, you know, it's like, <laughs> no, even if an angel from heaven comes and delivers to you a gospel that's different from the one that you received, then what? Anathema. Yeah, phony Maroni. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Colossians 2, and I end with this. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism, worship of angels. People get caught up sometimes in this. I've seen footage of somebody, you know, he's like, he began crying in, in, in his sermon. Well, there may be angels here even now while we're talking to each other. It's like, why are you crying? I mean, it, it, is he spanking you? I mean, <laughs> why, why are you why are you crying? Because there's there's always been angels attending to God's people. You know, he's why, why are you oh and then and then they start making up names for him too. <laughs> You can get long lists of crazy names for them. And then they'll tell you also their specific activities. Oh, yeah, this guy keeps the storerooms in heaven. This guy keeps, you know, the musical instruments. This guy, what are you talking about? Oh, yeah, the angels. Where did you get all these names? Well, Mystic Kabbalah, do it. It's, another word for that is nonsense. <laughs> if it's not in the word, it's not truth. And then yeah. here's the scary thing also, going on in details about visions. Listen, uh, puffed up without reason by a, a, a sensuous mind. Oh, I saw this and I saw that. And God revealed this to me and God revealed that to me. And they're spending all this time talking about that. You know what they're not doing? Unpacking the word. They're not reading the word. They're not applying the word. They're not living the word. They're just talking about their dreams and looking for the next thing, feeling, or experience. And the worst part is verse 19. They are not holding fast to the head. They're clinging to feelings, dreams, experiences, and they speak more of all these things than they do of Christ. Oh, that Christ would be magnified that he would be glorified in his church now and forevermore. Amen? So God help us with these things. So, are there apostles of Christ today? No. Because you had to have met those qualifications. You had to have seen the risen Lord, received your teaching directly from him, and be appointed by him. No one today has seen the risen Lord because Paul was the last one added to that list. Even if many think they have seen them, and we'll talk about this later on in the idea of visions and dreams, they have not actually seen Jesus. Because again, I might ask this, what does Jesus look like? And somebody will say, well, I saw a painting. Well, that's not Jesus. It may be beautiful, and it may even evoke some feeling or emotion from you, uh, but that's not necessarily Jesus. And I've seen all kinds of things, depending on, you can get an African Heritage Bible, and, and you, get, you have a black Jesus. I've seen Korean Jesuses. It's like, what is going on? Uh, not really seen many Jewish Jesuses, curiously. <laughs> uh, 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 because we all tend to remake him in our own image. That ought not be, you know? Uh, so what exactly did he look like? We don't know, because we glory not in what he looked like, but in who he was, in his being, in his excellence, in his character. And in that, he was the exact representation of the Father. Yeah. All right, let me pray, and then we'll... Uh, Right. <laughs> Lord, we thank you so much for the time that we can spend. And, and we thank you that you've made it really clear that we would not be deceived by anyone who steps up today and says that they are an apostle. 
that you have spoken to them or they speak on behalf of you. Lord, we thank you that that was done, finished, completed in the first century, in the days of your appointed apostles. Lord, thank you for making it clear that in this life, it's not about the things that we see, but the things that we hear from your message that's been once for all delivered. Lord, move our hearts, move our minds, move our souls through the riches of your word. Move us through faith with great and inexpressible joy as we contemplate the glory of our Savior, as we anticipate the coming of our Savior. But Lord, protect us from being deceived. Lord, those who themselves are deceived, I pray that you would wake them up. You would show them the error of their ways. Lord, we pray, even in your statement, that um, would deceive even if possible the elect. God, would you protect your elect? Early let them see the error of the things that men are sharing and the riches that are, that are abounding in your word. In Jesus' name we pray.